Welcome to the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast by Venus O'Hara. I'm here to welcome you into the world of orgasmic living by hosting experts to discuss orgasmic topics such as nutrition, spirituality, personal development, sexuality, and much more. Here, we will offer lifestyle lessons that can help you lead a fulfilling, joyous, and orgasmic lifestyle. I'm your guide, Venus O'Hara. Welcome to the 50th episode of The Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast by Venus O'Hara. In this new moon episode, I'll be discussing porn and erotica, and we'll be speaking with Cindy Gallup, the CEO and founder of Make Love, Not Porn. Then I'll be discussing the book I'm reading now, which is The Mask of Venus by me, Venus O'Hara. And finally, we'll be experiencing a guided meditation with affirmations for attracting business opportunities. But first, let me share with you some of my own reflections on porn. Let's talk about porn. I don't think I've ever talked about porn on this podcast. I must confess that I am not a porn consumer. I, and I also confess that I don't really understand it. In the same way that I'm a vegan, um, I see porn like meat. And I think people who give it up, they might have this underlying desire for it, but they think it's bad. And a lot of vegans are like that with meat. They just think it's unethical, so they kind of give it up. But deep down, they would love a burger. <laughs> and I kind of see it like that. However, my experience of veganism is that I don't actually like meat. So I don't have this ethical dilemma or conflict going on inside me. And it's the same, same with porn. I just don't find it alluring. And I'm very into erotica. <clears throat> I love I love reading. <clears throat> Excuse me. I also love a lot of hot series that are out there that do have sexual storylines. And I really love character build up and, you know, understanding the dynamics between a couple or even just two protagonists who engage in sexual activity. So I'm definitely not a prude in that sense. But with porn, I just find it really kind of um, a bit aggressive. and It's not doesn't really convey the sex that turns me on. My first introduction to porn was when I was around probably about tw around 12 or 13. I went to stay at a friend's house and um, and she wanted to show me on a on a video VHS player her dad's stash. And it was so weird. It was like um, this woman with an 80s hair hairstyle, 80s perm, giving an up close blowjob to this guy. And I just looked at it like, oh my God, I am never doing that. <laughs> it's so crazy because like now, obviously, I don't have any problems with oral sex, but just that little introduction was kind of traumatic. And also, I remember at school once there were some magazines that got kind of, um, that were found on the playground and being passed around. And it was all kind of like legs open imagery. But just think that is nothing compared to what young people are are finding today. I mean, I can't imagine what that must be like. And also the porn of yesteryear was pretty tame compared to what's out there now. So I can only, I can't even imagine what it must be like for some young people. Then later on in my life, um, when I had my first boyfriend, I was completely in love. Um, first sex, first love, all of that. And I, remember, I remember one day, he, he was, um, he completed me in many ways. I did not desire anyone else. And I remember one day he told me that he wanted to buy a porn magazine and he wanted me to wait outside the news agents. And I was, I was a kind of shocked. I was thinking, am I hearing this correctly? And then I didn't really know how to react. So I kind of said, yeah, whatever you want. And then um, when he came out with this magazine in a brown paper bag, we were on the bus going to his place and I was just in absolute shock. I, I just felt like so sad inside. I just felt that I wasn't enough for him. We had an argument about it and it kind of like twisted it to make it sound like it was my fault. But I mean, I, I just didn't really know how to convey what I was feeling in that moment. Um, but it was it was very, it made me feel very, very, very insecure because I had no desire myself to be looking at other people. Um, and now, of course, I think, you know, it's a bit naive to think that only one person um, can be in your in your mind or in your erotic repertoire. But um, yeah, it was it was very, very, very weird. Then much later in life, um, I've obviously become a sexpert 
And um, I was writing for this magazine that was very um, involved in the Nympha Awards here in Spain. And the Nympha Awards are kind of like the Oscars of the Spanish porn scene, the porn sector. And it was really funny because um, because I was writing for this magazine, they asked me to be part of the jury. And um, it was exactly, be- it was precisely because that there are, of the reason that uh, I, d- I don't actually watch porn that I was going to provide them with this different perspective. Um, so that was interesting for me. I had to actually spend three days watching porn scenes, different suggested scenes of the nominees from different categories, such as best anal sex, best fetish, best female actress, best supporting actress, all of this stuff. And I found it, the experience to be insightful. It's given me a lot of insight that I didn't have around around porn, but I found it deeply disturbing. Um, I found it was disturbing what I was watching, but also I found it disturbing what that people actually get off on this. And I find that kind of weird. Um, yeah, I just, I just wonder what's inside people's minds sometimes as far as erotica is concerned. And it's not always healthy and safe and consensual. I, I just um, I, I just find that very disturbing. It's part of the reason why I want to share my own vision of sexual beauty, because I do think sex is beautiful. It's what moves the world. It can be a constructive or destructive force, depending on how you use it. And also, I've also ex- I've experienced in my life <clears throat> some, time, some type of um, set, um, porn interference in my bedroom when I've been with guys who have obviously been watching too much porn and they have these practices or tastes that seem a little bit aggressive to me and things that I didn't consent to have happened. I remember once I was with this guy who was, you know, I, we knew each other very well. We had been friends with benefits for years. We knew each other's tastes. And um, one day he kind of opens my legs and spat on me before going down on me. And I was thinking, and, and the spit wasn't just to kind of lubricate me. I don't need lubrication. It was this kind of gesture of disgust towards me. And I just thought, whoa. And I, I just froze. I didn't know what to do. And I just kind of like put up with it. It was really weird. And he said, so he kind of ordered me around a little bit with some some kind of... Um, I don't know how to how to how to describe it like porn vocabulary, and I, I just didn't really know how to react to that moment. But I think it's really important to have discussions before you actually have sex with someone about about your tastes and your boundaries and your limits, because some people might might be really into that, but not everyone is. And I think it's important to have this clear because sometimes sex um, it can be it can it can get a bit hazy when. Um, when something happens that you you start off in a situation that you're consenting to and then something happens and you don't really react in a way because you freeze and you don't really know what to say it's um it's, it can be very uncomfortable so i think it's very important to have those discussions firsthand and um i am more interested in real life sex and also i'm i'm i'm, I'm an erotica writer i'm writing a lot of really hot things at the moment so i definitely enjoy um, erotic narratives, especially when there is something, um, some kind of non-sexual or non-physical dynamics going on between the protagonists, something that's, you know, in your head, in your heart, in your soul, that type of thing. I find it um, very, very exciting. And I'm, I'm also in my erotica, I tend to focus more on thoughts and feelings rather than the logistics of sex, like touching me here, touching me there, touching me everywhere. And also years ago, I was actually a judge on an erotic literature competition. And it's very insightful to see what narratives people play out in their minds and how they, how much they have been influenced by porn. Yeah. So, and, and also something that turns me on more is definitely the, um, the series that I've watched. One of my favorite films of all time has to be Secretary, which was is from 2002, and it stars uh, Maggie Gyllenhaal and James Spade, and they have this twisted love story that revolves around spanking. And um, you know, there's only a little bit of nudity at the end, but it's not really about that. It's about this, the dynamics, the energy between them, and and long stares and deep desire, and also you know, revealing something, a part of you that you don't really reveal to many people, they're very, in, your intimate desires. And um, that's what I, that's what turns me on way more than just um, what you see people being slapped around, choking and um, being insulted. I mean, this is like not even BDSM, this is what's, what you find on, you know, a home page of, of many porn sites. It's just 
absolutely shocking. So yeah, I'm not I'm not a porn person. However, I do definitely support um, and admire any initiative to try and um, fulfill people's desire to watch people having sex, but to do it in a very healthy and sex positive way. And that's why I'm so excited to speak to Cindy Gallup today. I watched her TED talk many, many years ago and I kept it in mind. I thought this is so cool that this exists, this um, website called Make Love Not Porn. And we'll be speaking to her more now about this fascinating topic. Now it's time for this episode's interview. We'll be speaking with Cindy Gallup, founder of Make Love Not Porn. Cindy, welcome to the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast. Thank you so much for taking part in this interview today. I'm very happy to have you here. For those who are unfamiliar with your work, could you tell us what you do? Sure. Um, I'm Cindy Gallup. I'm the founder and CEO of Make Love Not Porn. We are pro-sex, pro-porn, pro-knowing the difference. Amazing. I've been watching lots of your talks today. And one, one quote that I wrote down that really impressed me was, what we do in the real world is hotter than anything you'll see in porn. <laughs> Could you tell us about Make Love Not Porn, what it is exactly? And is there any are there any is there any content there that surprised you personally or that's kind of what tell, tell, tell us about your favorite favorite content that you've observed there? Sure. So for the benefit of our listeners, Make Love Not Porn is the world's first and only user-generated, 100 percent human curated social sex video sharing platform. So we are pioneering a whole new category that's never existed before, social sex. We're kind of what Facebook would be if it allowed you to socially, sexually self-express, which it clearly doesn't. The way to think about us is, if porn is the Hollywood blockbuster movie, make love not porn is the badly needed documentary. We are a unique window onto the funny, messy, loving, wonderful, comical, awkward sex we all have in the real world. We are socializing, normalizing, and destigmatizing sex, bringing it out of the shadows into the sunlight, make it easier for everyone to talk about, to promote consent, communication, good sexual values, and good sexual behavior. We're literally sex education through real world demonstration. And so, you know, we exist to celebrate the full glorious spectrum of human sexuality. And so, you know, what you will find on Make Love Not Porn is anything and everything that people enjoy doing in the real world. But I have to say that, you know, we're a social experiment. So, you know, we don't dictate what real world sex is. We put this platform out there. You, the world, you, our community to tell us. And to this day, you know, every week when we have our weekly team meeting and our curation team tell us about, you know, interesting videos of the comet come in the week before. Or, you know, to this day we go, wow, did not know that was a thing. That's what I've been saying for years. Real world sex is more innovative, more creative, more surprising, more hot and arousing than porn will ever be. And, you know, I wouldn't say that anything's, you know, specifically surprised me per se. It's just that you, you know, we we are privileged to be able to provide the answer to that question that everybody has asked since the dawn of time, which is, what is everybody else really doing in bed? And honestly, what's so amazing about that is not even really what people are doing, but the fact that these are glimpses of how people are having sex, people are loving themselves in the real world, and that is the power um, of our videos. And, you know, I'll, I'll give an example of, of what I mean by that. I designed Make Love Not Porn to be fully um, gender equal, diverse, inclusive, and we are. Our members now Make Love Not Porn stars, our contributors are, you know, um, all ages, male, female, trans, non-binary, straight, LGBTQ, um, you know, all races, ethnicities. Within the 10 years we've operated, and I will say this has surprised me, um, we've seen that we are especially a revelation to men. We are something unique that men will find nowhere else on the internet, which is a safe space where men can be and watch other men being 
open, emotional, and vulnerable around sex. You would not believe the number of men who write to us and say, I just watched my first video make love, not porn, and afterwards I cried. I've been saying for years, I wish society understood the opposite of what it thinks is true. Women enjoy sex just as much as men, and men are just as romantic as women. Yet neither gender is allowed to openly celebrate either fact, and we'd all be a whole lot better off if we were. Do you actually organize your content in genres like the kind of like you would see in conventional porn? Absolutely not, because we're not porn. Okay. We are real world sex. We are a social sex platform, and everything on Make Love Not Porn is consciously intentionally designed to make it easier for every single person in the world to talk openly and honestly about sex. Because we don't talk about sex, we have no socially acceptable vocabulary with which to do so. The language of porn has rushed in to fill that gap. And that is not good for a number of reasons, not least of the which is that, as you would expect with a male-dominated industry, the language of porn is predominantly male-generated. Mm -hmm. So the person who coined the term finger-blasting didn't have a vagina. Because okay. if you have a vagina and you hear the term finger-blasting, you want to cross your legs. Okay. <laughs> the person who coined the term getting her ass railed never got his ass railed. Pounding, banging, slamming, wrecking, destroying, all terms generated by people who do not possess the soft internal tissue to which those things are being done. So at Make Love Not Porn, we are building a new vocabulary for real world sex. We tag our videos completely differently to the way that porn sites operate. We tag our videos with terms like juicy, succulent, passionate, romantic, our term for masturbation is me time. Okay. Our term for anal sex is deliberately derived from the recipient's experience of anal sex. We tag our anal sex videos, ow, 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 hey, now. And we do this because we want our community to take this language and use it beyond our platform in the real world. Because this is language you can use to talk about sex in public without feeling embarrassed about what's coming out of your mouth, without having to worry being overheard in the bar, the coffee shop. And it's language you can use to talk about what you want to do in bed in a celebratory, positive, and gender equal way. And we're also using this language to reshape perceptions of, of sex. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm frequently caught up by journalists going, Cindy, I'd love to interview you for a piece I'm writing about how porn addiction in young men has caused erectile dysfunction. And I go, no, it hasn't. And they go, whoa, whoa, what do you mean? And I explained that, you know, porn teaches men that sex is entirely dick-centric. That it's all about how big it is, how hard it is, how, you know, how long you can keep it up. In the real world, men are frequently not erect or semi-erect. And so we celebrate that fact. We tag those of our real-world sex videos, where the man is not erect or semi-erect, with a term that is derived from the world of ice cream. We tag those videos soft serve. Something, I actually watched your TED talk years and years ago because I've been a sexual wellness content creator for 14 years. So it might've been around the same time you, you launched. Yes, that's right, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I was so impressed personally when you mentioned that um, your mission to eroticize the condoms. I've always been a big advocate for safe sex and making it sexy. And it's always missing in sex scenes when it's either written or some kind of... Um, De de depiction of sex themes. That's something I never really enjoyed about porn, just seeing all this barebacking. I was thinking, I don't know what, I mean, I've never really been into porn, to be honest. So um, I just didn't like the idea of, you know, someone risking their health for my orgasm or for anyone's orgasm, you know? So I really like the idea of eroticizing the condom. And I followed um, the you know, debates about that in porn. And I really liked how you um, mentioned that. So how can we eroticize the condom? Well, I'll tell you what's infuriating, Venus. I've been talking to Reckit Benkeys about Durex for 13 years mm -hmm. because, you know, I wanted them, them as a paying founder member of Make Love Not Porn because we offer the unique opportunity for product demonstration the way many products never get to be demonstrated. And to this day, they have not been willing to push the button because one of my biggest challenges with Make Love Not Porn is the social dynamic that I describe as fear of what other people will think. 
and fear of what other people think is rife within giant corporations. So, you know, I continue to try and find, you know, a condo partner to work with. But but here's the key thing about the unique approach that we take at Make Love Not Porn. So I designed Make Love Not Porn around all of my own personal beliefs and philosophies. One of which is that everything in life starts with you and your values. So I regularly ask people this question, what are your sexual values? And no one can ever answer me because we're not taught to think like that. Our parents bring us up to have good manners, a work ethic, sense of responsibility, accountability. Nobody ever brings us up to behave well in bed. But they should, because in bed, values like empathy, mm -hmm. sensitivity, generosity, kindness, honesty, trust, respect are as important as those values are in every other area of our lives where we're actively taught to exercise them. So what we have the power to do at Make Love Not Porn and what we want to do with the right condom brand partner is um, we have a completely different approach to getting people to want to buy and wear condoms. Because I designed Make Love Not Porn to be a badge brand. When you are a member of our community, what that says about you is, I'm good in bed the way it really counts. The real world says, I stand for good sexual values and good sexual behavior. And so we see condom carrying and wearing as a badge of good sexual values and good sexual behavior. We are out to make wearing condoms aspirational and to make that an area of social judgment for the better so that anybody engaging with someone who is carrying condoms, um, and, and by the way, across the board, women as much as anybody else, um, and who insists on using condoms, that is a badge of good sexual values. And that is what you want to be. And that is who you respect. Absolutely. I'm such a condom advocate. Um, so lots lot has happened in the last 14 years in the sexual wellness space. Has Make Love, Love Not Porn evolved in the way you thought it would? Is there any, anything that surprised you over the last 14 years? Well, I'll tell you the thing that most surprised me immediately, Venus. I had no idea when I embarked on this venture that my tiny team and I would fight an enormous battle every single day to keep Make Love Not Porn alive, let alone desperately try to grow it. And the reason for that, um, which our listeners may not be aware of, is that every single piece of business infrastructure that any other tech startup takes for granted, we can't, the small print always says, no adult content. We can't get funded. We can't get banked. It took me four years to find one bank here in America that would allow me to open a business bank account for Make Love Not Porn. Try running a business for four years without a business bank account. Wow. Talk about how I did it, in ways I shouldn't have, but it makes life extraordinarily difficult. Every single tech service we need to use to operate our video streaming platform, hosting, encoding, encrypting, the terms of service always say no adult content. In every single case, I have had to go to the people at the top of the company, explain what I'm doing, beg to be allowed to use their service. Sometimes they let me, sometimes I don't. It's a very labor-intensive process. We never get to work with the best in class of anything. We can't pick and choose our business services. And the two biggest business growth inhibitors for Make Love Not Porn are A, payments. Mm -hmm. PayPal mm -hmm. won't work with us. Stripe won't work with us. American Express won't work credit. You know, mainstream credit card processors won't work with us. We have to work with adult-friendly payment processors who, because anybody adult has nowhere else to go, charge extortionate fees. I pay out 12% of my revenue every month in payment processing fees. Try growing a business when that's where 12% of your monthly income is going. And the second massive business inhibitor is that we are banned from advertising anywhere. Make Love Not Porn cannot advertise on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Google, Snapchat, TikTok, Reddit, Twitter, and on any traditional media platform. Try growing a business with both of those business growth inhibitors. You know, the, the biggest thing we have to celebrate at Make Love Not Porn is that we're still here. Mm -hmm. And it's extremely ironic that we are banned for advertising because, so we are not allowed to do paid Google search advertising. 
But every day, all around the world, people search for Make Love Not Porn without knowing that we exist. And what I mean by that is the top organic search terms that drive people to us are Make Love Not Porn, Real Sex Not Porn, Video Sexo Na Porno, Make Love Not Porn, where they don't know there's a company called that. One young man told me he found us when he Googled porn that is not porn. Oh, wow. He was, I wanted something different. No idea what to search for. When you search porn that is not porn, you find make love not porn. That is how much the world is desperate for what we are, knows it needs us, and badly wants us. That's a gigantic billion-dollar business in waiting. And the other indicator of the scale of the opportunity, when I can raise the funding I need to overcome all of these barriers, is every year, at the end of the year, um, Pornhub releases their year in review. They release an annual study where they analy analyze their gigantic trove of data on their gigantic platform, and then they highlight what they see as the biggest trends within it. For their year in review 2022, which was released a couple months ago, Pornhub identified that the number one trend across their gigantic platform is what they call reality. People are looking for real. And when that study came out, I shared it all over my social channels. I said, what all those people are looking for, although they don't know it yet, is make love, not porn. That's how huge an opportunity is when we can have access to the capital we need to overcome all of those daily business barriers trying to shut us down. Yeah, it's really hard when people think that sex sells. It's just so not true, is it? It's really hard. You have to really uh, work the work even harder and also tiptoeing over all of this censorship. I, I know all about the payment plans. I have I have a, a members area on my website with through with um epoch. So I know about the big uh, the big fees. It's unbelievable. Then paying a thousand a year just to keep it open, you know. So it's uh it's it's hard for me as well. It's uh and, and have a house have those things like OnlyFans, have those kind of influence your business because that's kind of like creator owned content has that kind of um influenced your business in some way or, or on other trends in terms of content have they um no not at all um quite the opposite i foresaw the creator economy 14 years ago mm -hmm. when i designed make love not pawned around a revenue sharing business model to democratize access to income so i i i was doing the creator economy many many years before only fans was an enormously frustrating thing is you know, OnlyFans had and has a fantastic opportunity to mainstream this for the rest of us. By the way, they've been able to grow because A, um, white male founders found it a lot easier to get funded. Last year, only 1.7% of all venture capital went to female founders. Okay, and I represent the triple whammy of unfundability. I'm female, I'm older, and I have a sex tech venture. And secondly, um, OnlyFans works with PayPal and Stripe. Because they oh, represent wow. themselves as a general fan platform. Yeah, and you make so much money. PayPal and Stripe are really willing to turn a blind eye to what everybody knows, which is that, that growth and that revenue is entirely powered by adult content. And they're happy to buy into the, oh, yep, no, we work with OnlyFans because they're a general fan platform. If I could work with PayPal, if I could work with Stripe, we'd triple our income overnight without doing anything else. Right now, our transaction declines are running at 39.3% on Make Love Not Porn. Nearly 40% of our members are trying to give us money and can't. That's because banks are flagging our transactions as having an adult merchant code. You know, that goes away when I can work with PayPal and Stripe. So that is, as I say, that is one of my two massive business inhibitors. And so um, what I'm doing, um, Venus, is... so. You know, for 14 years, I've parallel path two things, working to build Make Love Not Porn and working to change the business and cultural context around it. Because when you have a truly world-changing startup, you have to change the world to fit it, not the other way around. So 14 years ago, when I discovered all of these financial barriers that I was coming up against, somebody said to me, Cindy, to do what you want to do with Make Love Not Porn, to build the business you want to, you're going to have to start your own bank. Wow. And I was angry. I went, I'm going to start my own bank. So I literally 14 years ago investigated starting my own bank. 
And that was when I discovered it's impossible to start a bank here in the US. Okay, regulation made that completely impossible notion. So, so I, I gave up on that. But for 14 years, I've monitored fintech every single day. And for 14 years, I've talked to banks because I want to build or acquire um, or merge with the stripe of sex tech. And the key to doing that is not the technology, which is the relatively straightforward part. It's finding a bank who will underwrite it. Mm-hmm. So I've been looking for, for a bank that gets the enormous revenue opportunity for 14 years. And encouragingly, um, I'm talking to investors more and more who see the opportunity inherent in what I want to do, which is basically um, get funded and build the infrastructure of sex tech. Because to every business obstacle I encounter is a huge disruptive business opportunity in itself. And so, you know, to, um, I'm trying to raise a serious round of funding to scale Make Love Not Porn right now to build it out in all of the ways that I've wanted to for 14 years but never been able to do before because of lack of capital. And, you know, I, I, w- I was talking to some people who want to help me find investors. And they were saying to me that, that they, they know somebody here in New York um, who is a big property investor who bought a local New York bank to process his own mortgages, which obviously makes sense. Right? And they were actually saying this because they thought they could introduce me to him and he might be open to this. But then they said, and do you know, Cindy, he bought that bank, him and his group of investor friends, for $18 million. They went, we bet you could raise funding to buy a bank. And I went, guys, I love the way you're thinking. Got to raise funding to make love, not porn first, you know, but that's a very interesting concept. So I was having this conversation with another of my investors who is Europe-based, who told me that he had been offered the opportunity to acquire a digital European bank for 2 million euros. So I said to that investor after Silicon Valley Bank imploded over here in the US, um, there's never been a better time to buy a bank. So um, when I find investors who get it, who get the opportunity to be the bank that underwrites not just make love, not porn, but the strike of sex tech will, you know, basically open accounts and process payments for everybody in this sector. And by the way, as my make love, not porn team will tell you, I've said to them regularly, if I ever get the chance to acquire a bank, I'm opening that bank up to every single sex worker around the world to enable them to open accounts and take payments. Oh my fucking god! The revenue opportunity. Imagine, mm, amazing. So, so you know, I'm all about building solutions to my own problems, and and that's what I'm out to do. The only thing holding me back is lack of access to capital. And when I can find investors who get it, then I can make this shit happen. Absolutely. So, prior to launching Make Love Not Porn, were you interested in sexuality as a potential business venture? No, n- n- not in the slightest. Make Love Porn was a complete and total accident. We are literally the startup the world asked for. Wow. And um, um, what's the next one? So many of your talks, you talk, you you say you want to encourage people to talk about sex. Uh, for people who are not comfortable with the topic, do you have any tips that you would like to share? Sure. So, you know, people um, regularly, you know, ask me, um, they say very nicely, you know, Cindy, I love what you're doing. I want to support it. You know, um, I've subscribed, you know, I've signed up, I've subscribed, which by the way is how I encourage everyone to support us. Subscriptions start at $10 a month. It's very affordable. They say, if I'm an investor, you know, I would happily give you money. Sadly, I'm not. How else can I help? And so what I say is, you know, at Make Love at Porn, we are spearheading what we call the social sex revolution. The revenue part is not the sex. It's the fact we're finally making it social. So what I say is there's one micro action that you can undertake every day that will help us and what we're out to do. And that is very simply talk about sex. But then I explain, I don't mean go out there and talk about sex. What I mean is, you know, in the course of your daily life, if you happen to find yourself in a situation or a conversation where if we weren't so fucked up about it, it'd be perfectly natural to talk about sex, do that. So my own example of this is, you know, so on social media, 
we all have friends who are celebrating their birthdays, going on vacation, posting photos of the party, you know, of the fabulous resort. And everyone's leaving comments going, oh, my God, happy birthday or, you know, hope you have a lovely time. And so I will leave a comment that on the birthday post goes, happy birthday, hope you had great birthday sex. And on the vacation post, I'll leave a comment going, Gloria's speech, hope you had great sex on it. Because you know they are. You know, and, and when you do that, you normalize it. You know, my friends reply going, ha, oh, yes, we did. You, you know, um, that's what I mean by socializing sex. You know, it, uh, and, and by the way, it's, it's why I think there was such an extraordinary response, even 14 years ago, to make love porn in its original iteration, which was a clunky little porn world versus real world site. Because makelovenotporn.com 14 years ago was a manifestation of me. And what I mean by that is it was straightforward, honest, truthful, down to earth, utterly non judgmental, and it had a sense of humor. We never get to have conversations about sex within those parameters. The moment we do, the floodgates open. Because the one thing the past 14 years have told me is that everybody is dying to talk about sex. Absolutely. That happens when I, when, with my work as well. When I meet people, people are seeing, because I'm a sex toy reviewer, I have 800 toys here and I've, I design as well. So, But when people assume like I'm going to be judged negatively, but what really happens is that people tell me their secrets. So people are really dying to tell yeah, exactly. Talk about this. Exactly. Yeah, I met a girl on, on um, the weekend who I, I've just seen her around this Coke, this private members club where I go. And she confessed when she found out what I did, she tells me that she's never had an orgasm. I wonder how many people in her life that she's told that to, you know, it's just, it's yeah. just everyone's bursting with a desire to, to share about this topic. And also you said in one of as many of your talks that you wanted to change the world, the world through sex. How can sex change the world? So make love, not porn as a neat venture has an utterly neat capability. We have the power to change people's sexual attitudes and behavior for the better in a way that nothing else can. And we have 10 years of proof of concept. So our community has written to us for 10 years to tell us that we've helped young people realize that porn is not sex in the real world. We've saved countless marriages and relationships. You know, uh, we've inspired numerous communications breakthroughs because we're social sex. Couples watch our videos together. And what's important as I was referencing earlier is it's not just what we do, it's the way that we do it. Everything we do is consciously, intentionally designed to socialize sex. So, for example, you know, way back in the day when we were building the site, my brilliant user experience designer, Uni Chase, said to me, everything on the internet to do with sex is dark and black. Mm-hmm. We're going to be white. And so that's why I have a white background to make love on, because we're literally bringing sex out of the shadows into the sunlight. And so couples tell us that, you know, Watching our videos together made it as easy and natural to talk about what happens in them as when they're watching TV or Netflix. And from there, it's like one step, you know, further to, you know, talking about their own sex life and what goes on in that and having like real breakthroughs as a result of that. You know, we, um, we've we helped numerous people um, with different sort of health scenarios. Um, and what I mean by that is, you know, we reflect what happens in the real world. We have a ton of Make Love Not Porn stars who, you know, live with chronic pain, are going through menopause, have had a hysterectomy, who share, you know, what you will not see anywhere else, with which is how you, you know, um, basically continue your sex life, you know, adjust your sexuality in under those conditions. We have cancer survivors. And so we have People who have the same issues writing back to us saying, oh, my God, this was so helpful, you know, this, this was so useful, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, what is always interesting with any disruptive technology is the use cases that emerge that the founder never dreamt of. So I'm blown away every day by how well Make Love Not Porn does things that I designed it to do, but also how well it does things that I never consciously designed to do. In the latter mm-hmm. camp, are we hear regularly from survivors of rape. Wow. sexual assault, sexual abuse. We hear from female survivors, male survivors, trans survivors, non-binary survivors, who tell us that Make Love Not Porn help them reclaim their bodies. We help them feel able to be sexual again in a scenario where porn is way too triggering. 
And we hear this not just from the people who watch our videos, but from our Make Love Not Porn stars. You know, several Make Love Not Porn stars have told us that being able to share themselves sexually in a completely safe and trustworthy space has helped them heal and pro process and heal from sexual trauma. And, you know, that's a use case I never consciously envisaged that we could help with. And I'm just so humbled and grateful that we can. So, so honestly, you, you know, what I decided to do, Venus, was to make it easier to talk about sex, just very simply take every dynamic in social media and apply them to this one area of universal human experience that no other social network platform allows. And having done that, we see that that is as transformative when it comes to sex as it's been transformative in every other area of people's lives. That's interesting. So, uh, so it's interesting how sex can change other areas of life. I, I really think that, I mean, in my work with promoting sex toys, it's all about, I, I find that when women become more orgasmic, it helps. It's helped me in my, in my emotional life because I was making better decisions, you know, because I, was, I wasn't just relying on this, some, some guy like to solve my sexual desire. I was kind of like becoming independent and that kind of helped me emotionally as well. And also you just you're, you're, No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Because we're so fucked up about sex, we've defaulted it to an act, to a thing we do. It's not, it's personality. Who we are sexually informs everything about how we feel about ourselves, other people, our relationships, our lives, our happiness. And so, you know, what Make Love Not Porn is doing is making our community completely comfortable with and accepting of themselves as a sexual being. And when you incorporate that holistically into who you are in totality, it's transformative. I always say that, you know, one of the side benefits of when I've gotten Make Love Not Porn funded to scale to be the Facebook of social sex is that we will see productivity shoot up in offices worldwide. Oh, wow. <laughs> Great claim. It's amazing. Um, so what? tell us what is um, If We Ran The World? Uh, that was my original startup, which I had to back burner when Make Love Not Porn blew up. Because even I, you know, to, um, superhuman as I am, cannot run two startups simultaneously. Um, so If We Ran The World was co-action software designed to help companies um, implement what I consider the business model of the future. Shared values plus shared action equals shared profit, social profit and financial profit. I had to put If We Around the World on hold to build Make Love Not Porn, but I designed Make Love Not Porn with its revenue sharing business model around um, that model of shared values plus shared action equals shared profit. Yeah, I saw your TED talk about different ways to change country or something. And also, I actually went on the website earlier and I filled in um, how, how I changed the world. My, my answer was to teach the world about the beauty of sacred sexuality. Because I think there's this part of sexuality which is just so beautiful when you're not just with a person, but with yourself and with the divine, if you believe that. But it's just such a celebration of your body and, and your nerves and sensations and emotions. And uh, that's why I want to... Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And so going to, to another different topic, something else that's really inspired me. I watched your um, style like you. I watched it in, when it came out. So I loved it. And I'm a single child-free woman. So I, I find it really inspiring when other ch single child-free women share their experience in a really positive way. And I loved how that the headline was that you're not a relationship person and you cannot wait to die alone. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's crazy. It's really funny. Because I think sometimes people think you're going to have kids so that you're you're not alone when you're when you're older, and this is just such a myth. Is because your kids can go and live in Australia. You just uh, you just never know, do you? It's, 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 you know, and, and that's a very bad reason to have kids. <laughs> exactly, it's like it's out of fear, not out of love. It's like you know, yeah. fear of being yeah. alone. Um, so so um, so have you ever felt pressure to get married? On and do you think over the time that these attitudes have changed? Because now we're in a time when. There are more and more women who are single and child free. And I mean, here in Barcelona, I'm, I'm in a very, I'm in a very expat community, and with a lot of women who've settled here. And I only have one friend with a kid, and we don't really envy that person. <laughs> but, um, but I mean, so, I know so many women who are single and child free. Um, have you found that it, attitudes have changed over time? No, not at all, because there aren't enough of us speaking out. Oh, okay. So, so it needs every single one of us. Um, who is very happily single and child free to be as vocal as I am about that topic deliberately. 
I was thinking about the Chelsea Handlers made some videos that were really criticised lately. They were really funny, you know, and she wakes up and she goes, oh, I don't have kids, I can stay in bed, you know. I could... yeah, 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 no, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, I, um, I was interviewed um, recently where the interviewer said to me earnestly, so Cindy, you know, do you have a daily form of self-care to help you with all the startup stress? And, and I went, oh, yeah, you know, my form of self-care is I have no husband, I have no children. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, I read this book a couple of years ago called 40 Reasons Not to Have Kids. It was very revolutionary in France and the woman's done lots of talk shows and she actually has two children and then they missed, they missed out the pelvic floor. <laughs> That's like the 41st reason because it's very, you know, people don't really talk about that either, you know, about what happens with um, with childbirth and what have you. Ooh. Um, and also, uh, you know, there's a study from the US and the UK that suggests that women who don't marry or don't have children are actually the happiest group in, in society. Yeah. I, w- I would endorse that. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so a couple of, uh, what, are you, what are you currently working on? Um, make love look porn. Um, I'm, I'm working to raise funding to be able to do with it all the things I want to do. That is my single-minded focus. Amazing. Um, what's the uh, a couple of quick questions for you? What is the book that changed your life? Um, I don't really have one to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm a voracious reader and I read vast amounts of books. So, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say that any one book has dramatically changed my life. I can't think of one anyway. I would, although, of course, you know, I live in hope that one day the book I write. Okay, I'm going to... when it becomes a bestseller, and yeah, I've got to. I have a book agent for whom I've been spectacularly failing to write a book for a very long time. And in fact, um, people do regularly, you know, ask me to write a book because they'd love to read it. So, so at some point, I hope to write the book that will then change my life. And what do you focus on, like the whole life, or would we we still something specific part? Well, well, I actually, um, so I have a Substack, um, dear Cindy, where I answer people's questions, um, which I started because. First of all, as you can imagine, for the past 14 years, I've had a ton of people writing to me asking for sex advice, <laughs> but also people ask me on social media all sorts of questions. And so um, for the benefit of our listeners, if you go to Dear Cindy on Substack, you can ask me anything you want. Um, and each week I reply to one or more readers' questions. And so this past week, I replied to a couple of readers, one of whose question was, you know, when will we have the Cindy Gallagher autobiography? And um, and then actually very flatteringly said, and, you know, I would love to see the movie and I think Michelle Yeoh should be the lead. I went, oh, my God, Michelle Yeoh's a goddess. Thank you so much. But, um, I, I mean, you know, I'm not sure that I'd want to write my autobiography, to be perfectly frank. Um, I, I would like to write um, a book that is enormously helpful to women worldwide. And, and so I think it would be a distillation of, you know, a lot of the things I talk about in my business speaking in my social posts that that would help other people, especially women, um, improve their lives and improve their business. Focusing on sex or everything? Or just sex? No, 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 everything. Amazing. Okay. Do you have a phrase or affirmation or quote that you live by? Um, I think, you know, simply, um, uh, and again, you know, I really encourage more people to, to do this. Um, the best moment of my life, and it wasn't a moment, it was a gradual realization, was a day that I realized I don't give a damn what anybody else thinks. Because that is the only way to live your life. Fear of what other people will think is the single most paralyzing dynamic in business and in life. You will never own the future to care what other people think. So I would say just, you know, don't give a damn what anybody else thinks. I can second that. 14 years ago, that was my fear. I'm going to start a sex blog. Who's what people are going to think about it? And I realized that, you know, I was more scared of not doing it. When it got to the point where I was scared of not doing it, you know, not fulfilling my dreams, that's for the mm. point when you just go for it and you just don't care. And also it's really good to filter out those people who don't support you, don't you think? No, oh, no exactly. I'm a big fan of be your own filter. You know, mm. be loud and proud about who you are, what you're doing. You will attract you the people who want what you do. You will repel the ones who don't. And you want to repel the ones who don't. They're a waste of time, effort and money. Excellent. It's nothing like sex to kind of make people uncomfortable as well. <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. And, you know, you know, I mean, it is very challenging for me finding investors, but in a way, I'm really glad that my investors are self-selecting 
mm-hmm. you know, um, because unlike more conventional female founders, that means I don't have to be rejected 300 times. You know, mm-hmm. at least when I'm talking to somebody, the very fact I've gotten across the threshold means that they get it at some level, you know. And that's been especially interesting um, with this particular um, uh, fundraise. I've kept Make Love Upon operational for 10 years on just $3 million of funding. And anybody in the business world will acknowledge that that's an extraordinary feat. So I'm now looking to raise a serious round of funding. I'm looking to raise $17 million to, to build out a number of brand extensions to Make Love Not Porn, including a zero to 18 and beyond sex education version. And my challenge is, and always has been, that I know that my investors are out there. There are a ton of them. There are a ton of them in every single country in the world. There are a ton of them in Barcelona, by the way. <laughs> um, but they are impossible to find by the usual means because they all have one thing in common. Your willingness to fund Make Love Not Porn is entirely a function of your personal sexual journey. It's a function of your personal lens on sex and sexuality that's been shaped by your own experience. And I have no way to research and target for that. Especially because, and you'll know this, sex is the one area where you cannot tell from the outside what anybody thinks on the inside. The people who look like they would totally get it, don't. The people who look like complete prudes do. And so my investor finding strategy has had to be, I deliberately put what I'm doing out there all the time across all my social channels. I do every media interview I'm asked, I go on every podcast because I have to make synaptic connections happen that will attract those investors to me. Now, theoretically, this is a long, slow, painful and highly inefficient process. In practice, it works. I am frankly gobsmacked the amount of incoming investor interest I have on LinkedIn. Investors write to me out of the blue on LinkedIn saying, I see you raising funding, I'd like to talk. I'm intrigued, tell me more. LinkedIn is my number one investor lead generator. Um, But I have to pursue that strategy because sex more than any other area proves the truth that saying, we do not see things as they are, we see things as we are. And I will never be able to persuade investors completely fucked up about sex to fund me. And so I have to find the people who get it. Absolutely. Definitely. So where can people find you? So um, they can find me and Make Love Not Porn on Twitter and Instagram at Sydney Gallup at Make Love Not Porn. Um, Our Facebook page is MLNP TV. I'm Sydney Gallup on Facebook. They can find me on LinkedIn, obviously. Um, do go to Dear Cindy and sign up and subscribe um, because um, paid subscriptions there, everything goes to support Make Love Not Porn. Um, my personal website is at cindygallop.com. And of course, you know, if you like everything I'm talking about, please do join us and subscribe at makelovenotporn.tv and consider becoming a Make Love Not Porn star. Amazing. So we'll be sharing all of your links on the, uh, in the show notes. Cindy Gallup, thank you so much for sharing. It's been so interesting talking to you. It's been a pleasure and everything I'm building is designed to propagate work like yours and make it a lot easier for you to make money. Today I wanted to speak to you about my own memoir called The Mask of Venus, erotic memoir of a woman who surrendered to desire. Isn't that cool? It's actually only in Spanish and um, I made sure that the editor did not have the rights in English because I was thinking... I'm not sure how much I want my story to get out there. And uh, this story covers my coming of age and it covers my life until I um, started my blog 14 years ago and really how my sexuality evolved and why I decided to become a sex blogger. Because being a sex blogger, you know, is one thing is enjoying sex. Another thing is actually working in, in, in in, in the sexual wellness industry and wanting to share your vision. It's really not easy. And there's many obstacles that I've had to face over these 14 years, you know, people judging me also, you know, work instability um, censorship and people think that sex sells, but it's not that easy. It's um, it does take a little bit more than a bit, bit more effort than other sectors. But I remember um, getting this book deal around uh, 10 years ago, and it was with the Planeta, the biggest Spanish-speaking um, publisher in the world. 
And I was so thrilled to be able to share my own story, get paid for it, and um, and spend four months just with myself, my thoughts, and my memories, and just writing all this stuff out. It was like having um, paid therapy. It was the most beautiful experience ever. And then having an editor um, and with you know giving me feedback on every single chapter and offering their perspective on things that were not quite explained fully or things that were ambiguous. So it made me kind of really rethink. And I also wrote the whole, the whole thing in Spanish, which was very liberating um, because it's not my language, but I do feel that, that I can really express my soul in Spanish. I can I can do many things in, in Spanish. I can really, really express myself very well. And also I started my journey, my erotic writing journey in Spanish, and it just felt so liberating to be using a different language. Um, I didn't, because the words I was using didn't have the same connotations as in English. And sometimes I would put my articles in Google Translate and I'd be shocked. I was like, oh my God, that's so intimate. That's so crazy or so scandalous. Anyway, I'm going to, I'm going to very, I'm going to speed translate live the first part of my book. And I remember when I got the book deal, actually, um, I kind of know how much people pay for books here in Spain. And um, I'd written a book with Penguin Random House called English for Perverts, which did very, very well. And then a few months later, Planeta poached me um, for the memoir. And um, so I, I, I knew I wanted to get more money than what I'd gotten for the first book. And then they gave me a very low offer and I just said, no, um, I refused it. And I also wrote um, part of the first chapter and stopped the story at a very hot and intriguing moment. And that actually meant that they doubled their offer, which was so cool. So my negotiation was pretty cool. Anyway, I'm going to read this um, part that starts off with my childhood um, and a bit of the background of what I come from, because it's not easy to um, to write about sexuality, given, you know, uh, my Catholic upbringing and all the obstacles I've had to face on a personal level. But I believe that this path wasn't, I didn't choose it, it was chosen for me, definitely. Anyway, lie back and enjoy. I'm going to, uh, there might be a few little mistakes here because I'm just reading a Spanish text and trying to translate live into English. Okay, here goes. Hmm. My fascination with the female nude started much before, much before I drew it for the first time. I was the type of little girl who would undress her Barbie doll to look at those charms that lay beneath. I remember studying her huge plastic breasts. They were pert and very big in comparison to the rest of her body. I used to wonder to myself when I'd have my own and what they would be like. Every time I heard someone get close to my bedroom, instinctively I knew I should dress her again, because I knew that these things were, for were forbidden. I wasn't able to study or draw nudes at school either, because that was forbidden in my Catholic school. Instead, I drew flowers, landscapes and portraits. I was born in the north of England to a fam Irish family, a very big Irish family. I had dozens of cousins all over five continents. And every time there was a family wedding, I remember my parents always competing to see who I looked like. According to my father, I looked like his side of the family, and my mother said I looked like hers. But the conclusion was that I was a mix of both. Despite these family reunions, I felt beautiful, but that wasn't enough for me when I was a teenager, when I started to want the guys or boys to notice me. However, with my white skin like snow, this was going to be very, very difficult. You're just like a ghost, my school friends told me. At that time, on a bad day, I felt ugly, and on a good day, I felt invisible. I tried to change the colour of my skin. I tried fake tan, but it smelled so weird. And then to my horror, after rubbing it in all of my body and waiting the four hours that were recommended to see the results, I had these dark patches on my knees and my elbows, and it was almost orange. But the worst thing was that when I showered, 
It wouldn't come off, and it lasted a week. My school friends laughed at me, and they asked me where I'd been on holiday, when they knew perfectly well I hadn't been away at all. On another occasion, I tried to sunbathe in my garden without sunscreen for a whole week, for a whole weekend during a heat wave. I wanted to burn my skin, just like lots of English tourists come back from their holidays in Spain. However, as much as I tried, my skin stayed white, like milk. And I wondered if that was because I had no pigmentation or something. I suppose at that time in my life, I wanted to fit in the crowd, as opposed to standing out. But after a while, I gave up, and I knew it would be better to accept myself as I, as I was naturally. When I was 16, I went to a new college to get ready for A-levels and university. It was also a Catholic institution. However, there I was allowed to draw nudes in the fine arts class. However, to actually go to life drawing classes, we had to go to another centre at night. That's because in our Catholic school, a live nude model would not have been possible. That's because of the nuns, of course. The other centre was very far, and there were not many people. And there were, sorry, there were so many people in the class that I could hardly see the model. In order to make the most of my time and to improve my drawing practice, I started to draw myself nude in front of the big mirror in my bedroom. When I showed my self-portraits to my teacher, he started to correct all of my lines immediately. I wonder if he knew that the model was me. These drawings were the, were the preliminary drawings for oil paintings, and we had to do one every term. We also studied history of art, and when I studied the old masters, I understood that much of many of them had been captivated by those reclining nudes with white skin and red hair. I studied those pale red-headed Venuses that were so in vogue during the Renaissance, and I wondered if I hadn't been born a few centuries too late. Perhaps it was obvious, but I started to represent myself as a Venus long before understanding what that meant. Anyway, that sets the scene of my memoir and um, where I've come from, what I've come from, and the silence I've come from. That's something that my, my therapist used to say to me, that I'm from silence, which is so true. And now I'm breaking the silence by sharing all of my experiences, visions of sexuality. And yeah, so this summer I will be um, celebrating 14 years, and I can't believe I'm still here after all this time. It's amazing, and I'm so, so glad I followed my dream, but I'll share more about that when I actually do reach my anniversary next month. And that's it, the book I'm reading now, The Mask of Venus by Venus O'Hara. Now it's time to slow things down as we prepare for this episode's guided affirmations meditation. It's probably not a good idea to listen to this while driving or operating machinery. Instead, take a break from whatever you're doing, get comfortable, take a deep breath, and enjoy. I'm attracting lucrative business opportunities. I attract the right clients, customers, and investors for my business. Success. Business Venture.
To find out more about me and my orgasmic lifestyle, visit venusohara.org or follow me on Instagram at instagram.com slash venusohara. Make sure to search for the Orgasmic Lifestyle Podcast by Venus O'Hara in Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Google Podcasts or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Thanks for listening. Have an orgasmic week and make sure every day is a climax.